and it is my great pleasure to welcome this afternoon to our uh, to our third lecture, um, Lisa Trindade Lima. She is my friend and colleague, and I'm very proud. We're very proud that she accepted our invitation and that she has joined us here today. Lisa is the president of the Fundação Oswaldo Cruz in Brazil. And José Mauricio Domingues will make the honor of introducing her, will have the honor of introducing her. So, Mauricio. It's a great honor, it's a great pleasure because we have been friends for many years now. And this is really an important personality in science in general in Brazil, in health policy, in social policy, in the social sciences. So we have someone really relevant for our discussion today with us. Uh, Nisia is uh, president of the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil. Uh, she's also associated as a professor to our institute, the postgraduate course we have at the institute, as well as a uh, professor at our university in general. And she has done so many things that I'm not going to list them all. Uh, I just will say that she was, she's, a, she, she's got a PhD from our institute in a formal life, a former life, UPERG, which existed before esp -ERG. She has then published her PhD dissertation. Uh, it's difficult to translate, Um Sertão Chamado Brasil, the big countryside called Brazil uh, in Portuguese, but there is a, a short version of that published in the Ox Oxford Encyclopedia of Latin American History. Uh, she has edited several books, published others, authored books, uh, including Pasteur and Oswaldo Cruz in Portuguese about Pasteur and this big uh, epidemiologist, the sanitarist that uh, gives the name of the foundation of which she's the president. And Ninja is member of the Brazilian Academy of Science. She has been working several UN committees for global health. And uh, she has been done lots and lots of things. And, and in particular dealing with a complicated political sanitary and sanitary situation in Brazil. I'm very glad that she managed to get some time for us today. And well, I think I have said enough and I give the, uh, the word back to, the, to, to, to Mariana. Okay, no, without, so without further ado, I present you Nisa Trindade Lima. Oh. So I'd like first, uh, I'd like to thank the organizer of this relevant lecture series on making sense of the post-COVID world. Professors Mariana Cavalcante, José Maurício Domingues, Sérgio Costa, Wolfgang Nobel. Um, friends and colleagues uh, with this important series in a so challenging, Topic as the post COVID world continues and changes. It's a pleasure to have this dialogue with all of you and to be able to share some of Brazil's experience in the response to the pandemic. Before I start the presentation, there is something I'd like to share. When we talk about inequality, we are emphasizing that so social relations and the di distribution of various resources, both material and symbolic, could be done indifferently. So inequality is already a concept that implies a value. And uh, I will discuss this during this lecture. It is also important to note that this presentation will express my perspective as a sociologist, and I thank you, José Maurício Domingues, to highlight uh, many points of my experience. But I would like to emphasize uh, research concerns, health ideas, and also the approach about uh, social inequalities in social sciences. But I have to say that uh, maybe in a major extent, my experience as the president of Fiocruz 
the institution that has played a central role, not only during this pandemic in Brazil, but as an institution that participates in building Brazil's health system, Brazil's unified health system, in, post -democratic, in the process of democratization of our country uh, after 1980, H is a very important point. So this experience as the president of Pio Cruz, of course, is very present in this presentation. But I'd like uh, uh, to be seen this, that this presentation should be seen as an invitation to dialogue. That's the most important point for me. I should show one brief opening quote for this lecture, lecture by the sociologist Klaus Eder in an article with the title, Societies Learn and Yet the World have hard, is Hard to Change. This quote summarizes one of the paradox of modern societies, challenge us to deal less naively with the issue of the pandemic's legacy. In situation of uncertainty, uncertainty, people, organizations, and institutions have to reorganize rules. In faces of routines, everyday knowledge, organizational knowledge, and institutionalized knowledge are sufficient to make the difference between truth and false, right or wrong, good or bad. In phases of rules for doing so can no longer be applied without uncertainty. I think that is the situation about pandemic, a situation with a great sense of uncertainty. There are many unintentional effects expressed in these possible paths stemming from COVID-19. Games of force and the immense social inequalities that extrapolate our desire for intervention in change in the direction that unifies uh, the collective health field, for instance, the, so to overcome the inequalities in the, right, in the direction of greater equity and uh, especially strengthening of democracy. Democracy was in focus, and I think that during the pandemic, uh, in a very specific way, think about uh, the ways to deal with this so huge collective problem. A uh, kind of disaster in the kind of total social fact, as you would like to use the concept by Marcel Mons. Much discussion has focused on whether societies learn from the lessons left by major disasters and pandemics. As a historical precedent, the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918 caused more deaths than World War I. Although that pandemic had some positive impact with the definition of new state agencies, such as the National Health Department in Brazil, it did not lead to greater so solidarity or reduction of social inequalities or more consistent public health policies. According to some authors, the huge health, social, and the humanitarian crisis of the Spanish flu was soon forgotten, although its genesis was closely related to World War I. And today, two years since COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, we have a new war, a war in Ukraine, as you know, new balances uh, in terms of geopolitics. We don't know the direction of this process. So a uh, really uncertain process and a certain moment and a challenge. 
for thinking about a, a democratic perspective. So I think this inspiration from Klaus Eder is important for us to reflect on the lessons we can learn from the pandemic. Uh, it's really possible learning lessons. The world is difficult to change. And I will focus today, especially in the inequalities challenges, but I think that it's very a challenging topic for our reflections and pandemic is a point, just a, a point to, to stress process in course in our society. I'd like also to start the presentation with a picture as well, which is related to access to an essential good for health, which is access to water. In this quote, to immediately calls to mind the position by the World Health Organization and 22 that says that the two public health interventions that have had the great, greatest impact on the world's health are clean water and vaccines. So you can see that our opening picture is associated with another essential component that I'm going to discuss today in confronting the pandemic, the manufacturing and the access to vaccines. Safe drink water and the vaccines should be truly accessible public goods, but uh, it's not true at all. When we talk about inequality, it illustrates the difficulties, not only with income, but also with the access to essential goods. There are important groups in Brazil that have monitored Brazilian society's performance in the reduction of inequalities, the impacts of public policies since enactment of the 1988 Constitution, examining not only income difference, but also health, education, among the other indicators. It is the case of research developed by many authors, among uh, uh, others, Marta Arret, Celia Scalon, and many other authors who contribute to this thematic. I believe the 23rd Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals are the main reference, thinking global terms in the role of the agencies international agencies to consider the relationship between the pandemic and inequality. It has the clear goal, SDG number 10, of reducing inequalities, but which also talks about the end of poverty, which is its first goal, and which has the, this issue of the reduction of inequalities at the cross-cutting line, including the phrase called so often, of leaving no one behind. At Phil Cruz, we developed a strategy to monitor this agenda. And I think it's important because of the international commitment it sets for the reduction of inequalities and some targets for all these SDGs, one of which is cooperation itself. Although many people may criticize uh, the rhetoric of sustainable development goals, in my view, they serve as the basis for commitments within multilateralism, another word in question today. So I make this reference in this sense. It's not that you believe that the world is going to move in this direction necessarily. But the SDGs are commitments, a fundamental fact for those who want to promote of justice, justice, peace, and citizenship. I also think it's important to share with you some discussions that are present in some conclusions of the Human Development Report published by the United Nations in 2019, the year before the pandemic. This concept conceived by Amartya Zen, in spite of many criticism, is important to encompass other indicators besides income. 
health, education, uh, quality of life, many processes uh, are in discussion with this concept. Why many people are stepping above minimal floors of achievement in human development is spread disparity women. A new generation of severe inequalities in human development is emerging, even if many of the unresolved of the 20th century are declining. For instance, the children in mortality and the increasing of life expectancy. This persistence of inequality, despite the improvement of many indicators, is a phenomenon that ended up being exacerbated in the pandemic scenario. We have seen that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on various areas represented by the Sustainable Development Goals, with an extreme impact on development efforts. The pandemic reinforced barriers, so achieving the SDGs and exacerbated the structural inequalities, gaps, and systemic challenges and risks that already exist. COVID-19 has overloaded health systems worldwide and interrupted important essential health services. In the case of Brazil, the unified health system SUS, as you call the system, is an important pillar, but at the same time it has suffered a historical process of underfinancing, which has been exacerbated in the pandemic. COVID-19 has imposed the unprecedented demand on social protection systems, which has undermined the capacity of local governments to supply basic services. It has kept hundreds of millions of students outside the classrooms, maybe one of the most serious and long-term process in the negative impact of the pandemic. It has heavily impacted the subsistence means for half of the world's workforce while exacerbating unemployment, a problem that has still not been totally accessed. And the pandemic has led to the closing of companies and factories. In Brazil, this impact must be seen considering the regional difference, as is a very different country with many levels of inequality. According to the research roadmap for post-pandemic recovery proposed by United Nations, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the, and the exacerbated inequities, weakness, and unsustainable practices that exist before the pandemic. Meanwhile, it should also give us an opportunity to recover better, conceiving systems from the human rights lens. But it's just a proposal is not a reality. Economic and social recovery should have five pillars in according to the United Nations. Health systems and services, social protection and the basic services, economic response and the recovery programs, macroeconomic pol policies and multilateral collaboration in the social cohesion and community resilience. This kind of uh, process is very different among, among the countries in the, just in this moment. As of course, a result of the inequalities in different ways to respond uh, for responding to the pandemic. This is an extremely important indicator. The pandemic increases the wealth of the wealthiest 1% in the world. This, unfortunately, is Brazil's position, as you can see, the first position, showing that the wealthiest 1% of the population not only enjoyed a considerable increase in wealth from 2010 to 2019, but Brazil also leads this ranking of concentration of wealth. 
Another important measure of inequality, the Gini index, showed that Brazil was the ninth most unequal country among 164 countries in 2020, and the wealthiest 1% earned the equivalent of 33.7 times the poorest 50% of the population. So these are indicators of Brazil's absurd concentration of wealth and of inequality. We contend that the conjuncture, the current situation, mirrors the historical structure of inequality. The pandemic further concentrates wealth and increases the number of millionaires in the world. 5.2 million individuals became millionaires during the pandemic. There was a 4% increase in their wealth during the pandemic. These are alarming numbers. Individuals with greater than $1 million in wealth increased their share of global wealth from 35% to 46% since 2000. The wealthiest 1% in Brazil has the largest, largest share of wealth among 10 countries. 30% of Brazilians are in poverty and 10% in extreme poverty. All this in a situation of a weak labor market, which exacerbates inequality in Brazil, unemployment, underemployment, and the decline in real income in the share of workers with formal employment. Given the situation in the assessment of the impact that inequality would have in the response to the pandemic, I'd like to speak briefly about Fiocruz's response to the pandemic. Fiocruz is a research and development institution in science and technology in health linked to the Ministry of Health of Brazil. But it's an institution with the particular characteristics, characteristics because we have uh, not a complete autonomy, of course, but we have a mandate, uh, in, we can say a kind of stability style, uh, position. Uh, but especially, I think that this example shows the importance of institutions, some institutions in Brazil. We generally, in pandemic and the, the process of mass media uh, shows this, some as isolated as scientists, individuals, but I just would like to reinforce the importance of examining the role of institutions. In our case, all sectors and units of field groups have been mobilized to face the pandemic, from the biomedical to the social sciences. Field groups is working on all fronts of, and plays a central role in the response of the Brazilian health system to the COVID-19 pandemic, from diagnostic with the production of kits and analysis to research clinical trials for medicines and vaccines, genomic network, communication, education, training of health professionals, support for vulnerable populations, specialized care for severely ill patients, and vaccine manufacturing. In Brazil, also, the Instituto Butantan in Sao Paulo play a very important role in the beginning of the pandemic, especially at the beginning of the process of vaccination with the vaccine in CoronaVac. One specific critical initiative at Fiocruz is the manufacturing of a COVID-19 vaccine, which became possible by a technological transference, agreement with the pharmaceutical AstraZeneca. We have already delivered over 160 million doses, and we have completed the national production of the vaccine with the drug substance produced at Fiocruz. Fiocruz has also been selected by PARO WHO, along with the laboratory in Argentina, as a hub for the development of production of mRNA vaccines in Latin America. This technology will add to the adenovirus platform already used for 
é, de Fiocruz AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. Well, I will ju just highlight, I think that's important to highlight the role, is special role uh, of information and communication. We created the COVID-19 Fiocruz Observatory, which aims to produce technical and scientific information to support the foundation's policy making and decision making uh, for all Brazil, Brazilian health system. The Fiocruz COVID-19 Observatory integrated the analysis on the epidemiological and social impacts of the pandemic, elaborates predictive models and scenarios for the upcoming weeks and monitors the impacts uh, of the COVID-19. In this regard, I'd like to highlight this article that I participated as part of the Lancet Commission on COVID-19, which proposes priority programmatic and police policy recommendations that governments, research partners, and relevant stakeholders should consider in formulating medium-term to long-term strategies for preventing the spread of COVID-19. Some of the recommendations are execute universal health coverage in social protection systems in every country. At the country level, ensure that governments and parliaments commit to financing and safeguarding health and social services to support universalism and equity. Provide digital equity for all. Boost the care economy and take immediate steps to transform the current model. Re-energize re relationships between government and civil society actors and ensure communities, marginalized populations and all gender identities have a central role in decision-making. The next part of the lecture will focus on lessons which I'm lost out discussing as challenges. My first comments may have given the impression of sexism or pessimism, but what I try to emphasize is the, is the need to expand the social foundations for us to qualify and create the conditions for an effectively favorable legacy. Based on this context, it's possible to address the major challenges that must be overcome for the future of health to contribute to a more equitable and fair world based on sustainable development. I'd like to present eight topics that I believe need to be considered to achieve this objective. Continue investments in science, technology and innovation and the promotion of equity in the scientific field. Reorienting research, technological development, and the innovation activities in the biomedical field to reduce inequalities. Decentralizing the production of health goods, vaccines, medicines, diagnostic tests, among many others. Strengthening health and social protection systems. Technologies must be understood within the scope of health systems. Strengthening surveillance and integration of activities in primary, intermediate, and specialized healthcare. Strengthening social participation and public communication. Strengthening global governance and the role of multilateralism. Strengthening the interdisciplinary approach in health and particularly in health emergencies. I think that's a challenge for social science and for every field of science. The first challenge is, according to John Bell, is his speak to, during uh, the global pandemic prepared summit, no totally new idea work, only the innovation that had already been seen the object of research and development for 10 or 15 years. Historical sensibility also allow us to better discuss the hypothesis that you have never had such rapid vaccine development as in this pandemic times. 
Such an achievement, achievement could only occur through systematic investment in research and innovations in the last five years, even though limited to some laboratories, companies, and countries. Hence, the viral vector and the mRNA vaccines achieved the acceleration in their development with this base. The AstraZeneca viral vector va vaccine and the mod Moderna mRNA vaccine, for instance, relied on consistent financing from the CEPI, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. So the idea of the so fast, um, rapid response should be better contextualized. As observed in an interview with researcher Andrew Polo, director of the Oxford Vaccines Group, when disease X emerged, the Oxford researchers and the other researchers and companies involved in vaccine technology development used all the knowledge previously acquired in their fields of work to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and to prove they were holding the key to solve the problem in record time. So I just would like to highlight the, the idea of process in the need of investment. Uh, sorry, I put the, the graph before the time, but it's now it's okay. Uh, this graph here is the example of Brazil in terms of instability in public investment in science and technology. This graph shows not only the decrease in investment in science, technology, and innovation, but also the instability with difficulty of earmarking funds in the struggle wage today. Uh, so it's a very critical think about the Brazilian uh, reality, just not only think about COVID-19, but as well think about preparedness, because uh, the, theme, the topic of uh, probable new emergence, I hope not new pandemic, please, uh, but uh, it's possible, of course. Uh, this, I think that this will be uh, recurrent and uh, topic for our discussion and for the public policies. Another key point during the pandemic, the World Trade Organization discussed a resolution by which patents will not be considered during the pandemic as essential health inputs for overcoming the pandemic. But what you see in this data go up to 2019 is that, of course, intellectual property is concentrated in the high-income countries. Only 10 countries concentrate 88% of all the patents in health. And here, I'm referring to biotechnological products pharmaceutical products from chemical synthesis and medical technology. In an article that I published last year in the CDC China Weekly, we observe the issue of inequality, but especially considering the role of science and technology in the asymmetries between countries. Among the other observations, we call attention to the inequality in knowledge, innovation, and as part of the production of important goods for health. In this graph, we analyze the asymmetries in terms of intellectual property. It is interesting to note the inequality expressed in patents. Uh, this topic uh, will be discussed next week in the, the uh, World Health Organization, WHO, assembly uh, more deeply. But I think that's a crucial point that think about uh, uh, the, post, the, the challenge proposed by this series, the, the lecture, the post-COVID world continues and changes. 
I think that is one challenge, one topic to change is the law, the international agreements about intellectual property. The second challenge is listed, I, I listed, is related to the fact that the pandemic is a social marker of the huge gaps in the, of the lack of equality at the global level. We need to reorient activities in research, technological development, and the innovation in the biomedical field. Much of the research is done according to market interests, which is natural if you go, if one considers the pharmaceutical company's point of view, but it's not all natural of if one considers the point of view of health systems and the public interest. I participated recently in an article published in Nature, and that discusses exactly this. The article makes several recommendations on the importance of decentralizing investments in science and technology, their orientation towards the health systems, while also identifying paradox during the pandemic. The central relevance of strengthening science, technology, and information for a new vision of public health in the knowledge society requires tackling one of the main challenges in all inequalities, the inequality in knowledge, innovation, and production. Without a more symmetrical distribution, distribution of production and innovation capacities, the growing concentration and the monopolization of health will prevent national and global response based on universality and the equity. It's important to increase low and middle income countries' capacity and to reduce their dependence on important health inputs. Meanwhile, it is indispensable to orient the investment priorities for health systems and to guarantee access. An equal access to research results and products during the COVID-19 pandemic highlights the urgency of revising the research and development system. It is crucial to change the model for financing and prioritizing research and development which should be oriented by health system needs rather than by market logic. The third challenge I want to discuss here is the need to decentralize the production of health inputs. COVID-19 reproduces scientific, technological and productive asymmetries. This new technology platform is concentrated in a few countries. Middle-income countries assess major technological platforms. Low-income countries without productive capacity. The mismatch between our goal, goal of universal access in the production and technology system creates vulnerabilities. That is, we need to reinforce the dimension of science and technology in pursuit of equality. It is not the only factor involved in the issue of equality, since there is an entire complex of discussion on this issue. Uh, I, in this, I just have a comment to do, because this uh, map is about the production of vaccines in the world, uh, and uh, we see the concentration. The next uh, slide shows us the asymmetry access to vaccines. Uh, is, uh, the data is of the September of 2021, uh, but it's important uh, to show because uh, this kind of inequalities had a considerable impact in terms of the different response 
and of course of the number of deaths just in that time. Uh, the, the idea of inequality of the distribution of vaccine. The fourth challenge is the, uh, the need to strain to health and social protection. Challenges for autonomy in scientific and technological development. Uh, support for research to develop new vaccines, training the retention of qualified personnel, development of local uh, chain of suppliers, strengthen of clinical research, regulation, and manufacturing infrastructure. Um, the fifth challenge is to strengthen surveillance and the integration of the activities in primary, intermediate, and specialized healthcare. I will focus in the Brazilian situation and uh, think about the importance of uh, a more integrated view. COVID-19 reveals the strategic role of science for the country's life and development overcoming the false dichotomies between basic science, applied science, and innovation. And that as well, the need of integrate the attention, the primary care attention, and all the levels of attention in an integrated perspective in the country. It, uh, the sixth challenge is the need to strengthen social participation and public communication. COVID-19 is not just a rerun for preview of previous epidemics. The quote by sociologist Anthony Giddes in a conference in the, 20, in the year 2020 highlights the unique nature of the world's recent experience. For the author, the current pandemic and the possible future epidemics will be heavily related to environmental factors, especially climate change, but also to the major transformation in information and communication resulting in what he calls digidemics. Information and communication became, become part of the pandemic itself and cannot be viewed only as an additional factor, a variable without great explanatory value. According to the sociologist's analysis, this leads not only to the negative externalities, uh, fake news, for instance, but also to an increase in the capacity for scientific response and science dissemination, in addition to new forms of resilience. Globalization is thus viewed not only as an economic phenomenon, but above all as a process, a process related to communication. The seventh challenge is the need to strengthen global governance in the role of multilateralism. On this point, a pandemic trip, as proposed by World Health Organization, WHO, will play a crucial role. This area features the hubs for vaccines and epidemiological intelligence supported by the organization. This issue will be discussed in the World Health Assembly that will start on the 22nd of May. As well as the declaration of the World Organization to change intellectual property to benefit access which will be discussed in the second ministerial conference in June. So the next couple of weeks, we will have a very important high-level discussion on matters that affect everyone. I also want to highlight here that in his opening remarks on the 150th section of the Executive Council, Tedros Adhanom, Director General of WHO, mentioned five priorities for the next five years, one of which is the urgent strengthening of the role of 
World Health Organization as a leading authority on global health at the heart of the global health architecture. And you know, uh, so difficult is the, this process of reinforced multilateralism. Finally, the age challenge is strengthening the interdisciplinary approach in health, in particular in health images. I see this uh, challenge as a challenge not only for the field of health or public health, but it's a challenge for the society and for all the fields of knowledge and especially for social sciences. The articulation of basic science with innovation and of social and human sciences with exact natural sciences is increasingly necessary. For us to understand the COVID-19 pandemic, overcome the current crisis and prepare for probable health emergencies in the future, it is essential to strengthen this interdisciplinary research, especially focus on the interrelations between natural and social systems. The pandemic clearly shows how outdated this dichotomy is. The collective health field plays a key role in the definition of a science agenda in the, and in proposing public policies based on knowledge originate from this interdisciplinary effort. Such an effort should value the diversity of theoretical knowledge and disciplinary traditions, but also challenge them to embrace a wider undertaking, namely a science agenda consistent with the major issues of the present and the future with even, even greater uncertainty. By all accounts, the control of COVID-19 today and in the coming years, as we deal with its prolong, prolonged impact and with prospects for new health emergencies, requires a deepening of democracy and the virtuous relations between individual and collective rights, the later with later recognition, but of crucial importance for the future of humanity. Thus, it is in the political dimension of social relations that we may bring see some positive lessons with the capacity for building projects aimed at greater equity, justice, and citizens' rights. Only thus can we foresee another world, not a new normal, after today's tragic experience on a planetary scale. There are the values that should orient the interdisciplinary effort and the resulting response to the health, economic, social, and humanitarian crisis that has shaken the world in the early 21st century. In Latin America alone, more than 30 million people fell below the poverty line after the pandemic. Severe disputes between national states over access to health products and services, especially vaccines, have generated deep planetary inequity as I try to show today. In the space of a, a year, scientific communities from different latitudes jumped from about 200 different immunization projects to more than 6 billion and 700 million doses of vaccines, effective and safe, already applied all over the planet. However, despite the global solidarity initiatives such as WHO's COVAX facility, Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, the, inequi the inequalities between the North and the Global South on access to vaccines against COVID-19 are abysmal. More than expanding access to immunization in this pandemic, which was killed almost 6 million people worldwide. Scientists argue that it's necessary to rediscuss 
international cooperation and inequities in science between countries with incentives for the transference of knowledge and technology, without which we will be even more vulnerable in the event of new health emergencies. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, published on August 9, 2021, a report entitled Climate Change 2021, showing that climate change caused by humans is irrefutable, inexorable, and will get worse. We are more than 7 billion individuals across the planet, as species who have altered landscapes in every corner of the globe, with our cities, industries, cars, planes, extensive agri agriculture, and the animal domestication. We produce and consume goods and services on a scale never seen in 4.5 billion of planetary history. The Amazon, the largest tropical forest in the world, marked by mega biodiversity, continues to be threatened by deforestation and fires and loses human lives among the traditional populations every day. There are historians who argue that we are not experiencing a crisis, but times of unprecedented change, which in turn will be increasingly common. A time of uncertainty may be a time for more challenges and uh, for thinking about the direction and the common agenda we have to construct. How to face this radical transformation of the peripheral place that, that Brazil occupies in science, economy, and the human development in the world is a question uh, here in our country. Returning to Eder's quotation, we can ask, therefore, only societies that produce risks are societies in which social actors really have an option to change the world. The process of response preparation for possible new health emergencies and social and economic recovery after the pandemic requires social engagement and a democratic perspective. Perhaps this is the main current challenge for Brazil, for the Americas region, and in the global context. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nisa, um, on behalf of the conveners. Now we are open for questions, at least here in the room. Would anyone like to begin? Mauricio, no. Well, Mauricio, no? Serge, I can begin. <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> this is just a... Okay, well, I just wanted to, uh, um, you know, see if anybody else wanted to come. But so, Nizia, thank you so much for this. I think that I speak for many Brazilians when I say that one of the few comforts that I had in the beginning of the pandemic was knowing that you were in charge of the Fundação Oswaldo Cruz and that you were capable of articulating uh, um, you know, all the agreements that led to the, to the fabrication of AstraZeneca vaccine here in Brazil. And so, and one of the things also that brought me a lot of anxiety in the beginning of the pandemic had to do with the quality of the data that scientists had to work with, right? So we know that we're, we were in the middle of this government that has been trying to do away with all sorts of public data. We've, we're having trouble um, putting together a national census. And in the beginning, there was a lot of resistance, right? And even in recognizing how serious the pandemic was. So uh, I'd like to ask you from your perspective, how has the quality of data that scientists have, have to work with, how has that improved? And how, how, how much of a problem was this, at least in the beginning of the pandemic and now as it has worn on 
Do we have uh, um, politics for ensuring the better quality of data so that uh, research and development can go on? Um, oh, thank you, Mariana, for this, your question. Uh, Brazil has uh, good databases, but we have uh, many problems with the sensor, as you had mentioned, and uh, we have many problems uh, with the data of the Ministry of Health during a time, a very crucial time. Uh, so it was really a very serious problem. But uh, we could solve partially this kind of problem. And uh, now uh, we uh, have the possibility of um, monitor the effectiveness of all the vaccines applied in Brazil, not only the vaccines applied for few crews. And uh, we have now a center, a center in Bahia, Salvador, Bahia, uh, CIDAX uh, is its name, is a center for integration of data the, in the analysis. The center put together, uh, for instance, the data of the Brazilian immunization program and the other data bases, uh, just making linkage. linkage. Uh, it's a very, very strong process, uh, very, crucial and strategic, but of course, uh, we depend of many bases from the Minister of Health. Uh, but I think that this topic of big data is uh, one of the strategic topic today for all the science fields. And I think that social scientists, uh, I think should uh, dedicate more time to this. Uh, so, uh, just to summarize my, my answer, uh, we have good research, epidemiological research with good data systems, but we have many problems during the pandemic. And the information, uh, as I tried to show, is a very crucial aspect. Uh, because, and especially if you think uh, with uh, Anthony Giddens that this, uh, the difference of this pandemic, one of the difference, of course, the world is very different from uh, the Spanish flu, but not only in the economic aspects, we have uh, the social dimensions and geopoliticals. Information and communication is a key uh, part of this process. So big data is a crucial topic and uh, in Brazil we had this situation, good data, but problems with the information and the data from Minister of Health, especially for almost two months. And of course, uh, this kind of process impacts uh, very much uh, the an analysis of the scientific community. Thank you so much. Um, now, Sergio, would you like to go or? Yes, yes, thank yes, you. thank you. And thank you very much, Lisa, for this uh, really very encompassing and also clear uh, presentation. Um, I have uh, two questions connected to your presentation, but also some evidence you uh, showed in uh, some articles you sent uh, us before. The first one has, uh, the first question has uh, to do with one of the points you addressed, this um, sort of dependency on the global north in terms of medical technologies. So uh, since as I got there, 88% 8 8 of all medical technologies in terms of patent are actually a property of, uh, of companies uh, and also states in the global north. And my question uh, is twofold the, uh, related to this. Uh, how the connection between medical technology and digital technologies, meaning you just mentioned big data, but also other forms of entanglement between medical advances in technology and the, um, yeah, the, the digital technology, technologies in terms of, of um, 
working with data, which is also very much, perhaps even more than medical technologies, concentrated in the hands of perhaps four or five big companies. So the question would be, you mentioned that there is a, a aim of changing this sort of concentration of technologies, of medical technologies in, in the global north. But at the end, if these big companies uh, dealing with data, which are, are more and more important for developing med, med, medical technologies, are in the global north. So how to change this constellation? Are there some discussions that combining this sort of two types of technologies uh, and how to overcome uh, monopolies and concentration in that field? I don't know, in the field of uh, w, uh, WTO or, or also not, and also uh, World um, Health Organization, if you know uh, if there are some discussions on this. And the second question is quite brief, is you mentioned one of the recommendations is to reinforce interdisciplinarity. And my question would be, uh, if in the uh, sort of international organization, especially um, special World Health Organization, if there are also some discussions in terms of transdisciplinarity, meaning that uh, non-academic knowledge is also quite relevant and has been also relevant for dealing with the pandemic. The ways how societies really learn to take, to take your quotation, not only scientists, but also societies developed ways of dealing with the pandemic and how the cooperation between scientific knowledge and this sort of, let's say, popular knowledge uh, could be also um, create better alternatives to deal uh, with, uh, with the sort of, of challenges we have faced during the pandemic. Thank you, oh. sorry for the long questions. Yes, another, another speech maybe, <laughs> another, another very good questions. Oh, I think that uh, in WHO, the focus now is especially in medical technology. Uh, in terms of these uh, inequalities between North, global north and global south. Uh, I think that digital, you have a completely right. Digital technologies is a very crucial point in the strategical. But uh, the, we, we, what it, uh, are being more discussed now is the hub for vaccines in Africa and South Africa, uh, how to develop it faster and uh, epidemiological intelligence. But uh, if you think uh, um, in terms of uh, data, of course, digital technologies are very, very crucial. And uh, I think that uh, is not yet uh, put on the table as we need to do. We have many discussions here in the scientific community in Brazil and at Fiocruz about the rights for, of, uh, for inf the um, rights of uh, information, of data access, organization, but uh, it requires uh, infrastructure of uh, uh, deal for deal with this da da data, so it's not uh, an easy. You have to. I think that you need a, a, a public policy for this. We had a law uh, recently approved in Brazil, but uh, it's not uh, sufficient to deal with this kind of problem. Uh, because of this, I I think that is very very important to have. Uh, uh, the centers data as CDAX. Uh, now in, in Brazil, we discuss uh, uh, the problem of digital health, but uh, I think that not uh, uh, so deeply as we need. I think that is a, a topic uh, for democracy, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a talk for democracy uh, very, very important in, and uh, in the health community is not so discussed as it should be. That's my vision. 
Um, the, the other point is about the transdisciplinarity and think about this relation between scientific community and society. Uh, this is a very uh, important point as well. Uh, in WHO, some discussions about this relation occurred during the pandemic, but uh, the idea of it, uh, is very, I think that is not very uh, well succeed and uh, maybe a narrow perspective uh, in terms of think about integrating uh, the organizations from social uh, civil society in councils in some uh, forums but not really to make uh, what uh, in some countries we discuss here yeah, the uh, consensus conference putting together actors from civil society and the scientific community just to discuss the main problems, the, uh, the very conflicting views about topics as um, agrotoxicals or as the climate change and many other topics like this. And the, all these matters, uh, in a way, uh, are related to health, and many of them have impact for the idea of preparedness, not only uh, response to pandemic. I'm sorry, I lost the window here for a second. Um, Maurizio? Okay. Nisha, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to put a question to you, which has to do with some things you have already said. You mentioned that the January General Assembly of the WHO, uh, which has now tried to, to regain terrain uh, lost uh, during the last years because preparedness was already a big issue in November 9, 2019, just before the pandemic, right? The, the WHO was complaining that these nation states were not doing what they should in terms of preparedness. And apparently now people have waken up, but it's not very clear how far this is going to go. Uh, you mentioned South African vaccines with, here in Germany, and it's clear that also the, the WHO is opening a, a surveillance center in Germany in order to try to control uh, the pandemic of, of possible future pandemics uh, more quickly and more efficiently. Uh, but I, what I would, uh, related to that, what I wanted to ask you is, as, during the pandemic, we saw also how this, this, this complicated, contradictory dynamic that has to do with uh, cosmopolitanism, universalization of policies and politics, and the affirmation of nation states, which have their priorities. You can see also nationalism really, uh, involved in that. Uh, how do you think this sort of thing is going to evolve? To evolve? Huh? Really, you see, we see now that this, the situation, the global situation is more tense than it was uh, just uh, six months ago, and especially if you look back and, and, and see the relation between the US and China some years ago. So this has, of course, a, a, a big impact over the WHO and, and how global health is dealt with. Some people had great hopes that the WHO would become really a political uh, agent. Apparently it has become more of a technical agent. But anyway, this, uh, what do you think about this? Uh, how, how do you answer to, to, to this? So I want to is, is uh, you are completely right. Is a, uh, it, it's, it's not exactly a paradox because uh, uh, I think that uh, the competition for vaccines, drugs, the the idea of the nationalism more than universalism uh, is part of a, a geopolitical uh, environment with uh, very difficult to have a, a leader, leadership. 
to organize an agenda, minimal agenda for crisis time. Uh, I think that uh, is, uh, is completely real. And uh, the role of WHO uh, was very fragile, I think, in terms of what it should be. Uh, now we have a very intense discussion about uh, health diplomacy, but what uh, uh, we see is a, uh, is a very difficult way uh, to organize a common agenda. And uh, I think we need this, but uh, as uh, we, see, we saw, many leaders uh, in, in the world in a process of restriction of democracy, new, new, kinds of, new types of authoritarianism, as you discuss in your book and the article. Uh, so uh, I think that is a crucial moment now uh, to try to organize a, a new commitments between some governments, at, at least. That's, I think, that what we can do this time. Try to have another agenda, and uh, uh, even it is fragile, the um, role of WHO is necessary, in my view, to have uh, uh, points with uh, a kind of commitment among leaders and among countries could be uh, put uh, uh, in, in March. Uh, and uh, about uh, the WHO hub in Germany, uh, we are following this initiative, uh, but uh, we know that uh, maybe we can have more stronger structures for preparedness. And Brazil and Fiocruz in particular uh, will take part of this process. Uh, but uh, I think that um, we have to see during this pandemic, if uh, du during this uh, next assembly, if you could uh, advance in more propositive, uh, in more uh, positive proposals for the pandemic and for recovery. Now, that is another point very important and uh, not directly related to WHO, but I think that the assembly had to, uh, to have a role in this process, in this discussion. Thank you. Wolfgang, please. Yes, thank you for my side for this wonderful talk. And I actually would like to ask you two questions. The first one hangs on to the one just asked by Mauricio. I mean, when you mentioned that multilateralism becomes important or is very important in order to fight the pandemic, that we need a kind of international cooperation, that is basically, I would say, a normative statement and probably all of us would share that view. But on the other side, I mean, due to the Ukraine crisis, especially in Europe, we see a kind of resurgence of the nation state and the resurgence of power blocks like Europe. I mean, whatever Europe is, but we are talking about the West, we are talking about Europe. So my, my first question is, do you experience in your own you know, dealings in international and or transnational organizations that it becomes, due to the current crisis, more and more difficult to go a truly multilateral way. So just, I want to know how you feel about this situation and how optimistic you are that it's going towards multilateralism. And the second question is, um, I was puzzled by your quote of Klaus Eder about the possibility that societies learn. And I have to say probably that I am much more pessimistic that societies learn in some sense because we have it here in Germany we had an oil crisis like any other country in, in 1973 we had a lot of you know tasks to do and we did it in 1973 and nowadays you know 50 years later we basically have the same crisis and we didn't do anything and even we are not able for power reasons obviously to shut down the highways on a Sunday etc etc so 
I mean, learning in a society is always a very, very difficult uh, thing. And I'm not so sure whether very heterogeneous societies like societies nowadays are really able to overcome the collective action problem and to learn from a crisis. So I would like to know your opinion about that. Oh, uh, bom, uh, challenge questions as well. Uh, I th I think that uh, is it's difficult to to answer really because uh, I think that uh, the multilateralism is a kind of uh, uh, a permanent process. You have to try uh, in terms to deal with so difficult contests. Uh, is a kind of uh, uh, a field of forces of uh, a movement. Maybe what you need is to have, as I had mentioned before, uh, to try to have a common agenda, uh, what the minimum agenda for this time of recovering and of preparedness at the same time. No, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't like this image of pessimism or optimism. I think that you need to have good analysis uh, about this process and uh, to define uh, common points to fight uh, for these points. Um, and uh, I, I feel during this time, uh, some points that I think that, uh, well, good, good points, not lessons. Uh, I put more challenge than lessons, but I'm seeing, uh, for instance, organization, more organization among uh, leaders, public health leaders of Africa. Uh, it's very clear for me in the international uh, forums and the uh, agencies. I think that's a good point. Uh, of course, it, we don't know yet the direction of this process, but I think that is good. It's good to have an organization um, from Africa discussing that we need not only uh, human resource trainees and things like that, but we need uh, capacity, uh, technological capacity in production. So this active voice from Africa, I see as a good point. Uh, at the same time, I see that Latin America has a, a more fragile position that could be. Now, um, the BRICS, another kind of arrangement, is um, is very difficult to, of course, we have a war, the position of Russia, China, uh, but the BRICS had a, a good position in the beginning of the pandemic in terms of production of vaccines, for instance. Uh, so I think that uh, we, ha we have a war, uh, a war now, and we have a war uh, with many uh, rearrangements. Uh, and we don't know very well the direction of this process. No? Uh, so it's... Uh, but I think that this pandemic uh, um, shows some different uh, dimensions of society. Information, uh, new actors, as I had mentioned when I think about African leaders in public health, um, maybe new organizations, uh, for better preparation for the future. So I think that you have to wait but at the same time, I think that you have to organize a common agenda, uh, organize uh, directed by the values that I, I think that's important in this contest. Uh, so I, um, I think that the, the topic of the learning uh, is more about uh, the capacity of uh, not only accumulate knowledge, but, but of uh, uh, enlarging the comprehension of our time. You have uh, uh, some pieces for this, but it's not of, I, know, I don't think that is completely clear. And uh, I think this is more a point, uh, another point for 
common agenda for we can organize and discuss about. Thank you so much, Nisia. We have three more questions from Berlin and three questions from Rio. The questions from Berlin were, um, were um, sent by students even before your talk because they read your papers, okay? And then, so I'm, I'm gonna ask you the three questions from Berlin and then afterwards we can come back and I'll ask you the questions from Rio. So the first question from Berlin is, that um, in your article, you stated that although some countries with diverse accumulated skills, such as the United States and the United Kingdom, had worse outcomes from the pandemic due to inadequate choices, um, while other countries like China and New Zealand had better results dealing with COVID, what were some of the inadequate choices? Um, if, if the US and the UK had made um, choices similar to, New, to China and New Zealand, would, do you think they would have had better outcomes? The second question, also from the students in Berlin, um, is that you explain the importance of social interdependence and how it shapes an economy of ethics, living, linking collective and individual, which is proposed by Norbert Elias. Um, can we claim that um, New Zealand and China were successful in producing this social interdependence as they were the two countries with the better outcomes? And the third and final question from Berlin is that um, in your article, you mentioned, quote, rapid, consistent and sustainable response by political leaders has also proven essential in countries that have achieved better results in the fight against COVID-19. Could you elaborate a little bit more on this? And then I'll bring you the questions from Rio that came after, during the talk. Okay, okay. Uh, so the idea of, uh, uh, we are now, and I can share with you after, um, preparing uh, in the Public Health Association, Abrasco in Brazil, a balance of the, a response specific of the Brazilian response of pandemic. But you have also uh, a book, but in Portuguese, unfortunately, about the different responses in different countries. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the idea is that even uh, countries with a very strong scientific and technological basis as the United States, could have a, a, a terrible response in facing the pandemic. Um, what explains this? Uh, because it's not, uh, I think that this cap capacity should be related to the public health systems and uh, of the government response. Uh, the time is uh, a crucial point. Uh, the testing, uh, the epidemiological data, and uh, the use of this information, not to deny the, the pandemic, but just to avoid the deaths and so on. Even UK uh, have, uh, uh, in the beginning, a, a very long response, uh, very well discussed by Richard Horton, uh, the editor of the, the Lancet, uh, uh, who discussed very well this point. Um, so I think that uh, the response depends on the scientific basis of the, the, the country, not only the technological basis, but the council, scientific councils, uh, if, uh, the, uh, cap the capacity of have decisions well informed, uh, and uh, uh, the capacity of uh, avoid uh, the spread of pandemic in the first stage. Of course, not now we have in another condition uh, the idea of the pandemic zero, uh, COVID-19 zero is complete, completely, uh, is, is a mistake just this time. Uh, so the difference response should be related to public health responses, uh, to the governmental responses, and they are very different among countries. And the best, the best results depended on the so fast the capacity to avoid the spread in the, the first stage 
and uh, the surveillance capacity, capacity after. Uh, so they, they, I think that that's what we try to explore in their article. There is another uh, question that uh, we did. Uh, I didn't, uh, I think, explore very deeply about uh, uh, the consequences of this kind of controls, epidemiological controls in time of pandemic for the social process, the community engagement, democracy, and so on. There is many studies that show in some places, in many, uh, even in some states in India, for instance, that uh, some places you had more engagement, social engagement, and uh, with good results. Uh, in Brazil, some municipalities try to do this. So I think that we have also to compare different ways to have restricted measures that are very difficult, of course, in any situation uh, with the more uh, comprehensive uh, discussion and social participation. Thank you, Nisa. Um, so now we can move on to the questions from Rio. Um, the first question is uh, from Professor Leticia Pinheiro. And she said, well, she thanks you very much for your talk. And she said, and her question is as follows. Taking into account the historical outstanding performance of Brazilian health diplomacy and the appalling conditions, uh, conduction of COVID-19 pandemic by the federal government, would you agree that, Brazilian, the, that the Brazilian international image is not as terrible as it was expected to be after so many errors made by the federal authorities, thanks to the role played by institutions like Fiocruz at the international cooperation effort, along with some initiatives taken by a few diplomats at some international organizations? And having said that, would you say that the impact of this critical conjuncture we witnessed was less damaging for Brazilian po foreign policy um, thanks to some of these institutions like Brazilian diplomacy and the public health community? So that was um, Professor Leticia. And here from the classroom, we have a question from Lisa that is, how has the COVID observatory analysis uh, analyzed the return of presential classes in Brazil? And if, um, if schools have become um, centers of COVID contagion. And finally, the last question is that at the same time, there have been inequalities between countries on health policies. Um, there's also inequalities within countries. How is the impact of such inequalities in services in Brazil? And what initiatives um, do you see this has for um, public health equality policies in Brazil? So those are the questions here from the classroom and from the audience. And this is where we stand right now. I don't have any more, so take your time. No, thank you, Mariana. And thank you, Leticia and the, the other colleagues and the students. Uh, about uh, uh, the uh, the idea of uh, uh, Brazilian health diplomacy and the Brazilian imagery, uh, I think that uh, uh, in I think I think that in many aspects the role of the uh, Brazilian diplomacy uh, not in the beginning of the pandemic, but uh, more recently. Uh, could be better than uh, other areas of federal government. And especially, I think that, but I think that the most important was really the role of institutions. Um, just uh, an image, I, um, in my case, for instance, um, less two weeks ago, uh, went to Portugal in an official mission, and uh, uh, all the Minister of Health and Science and Technology and uh, of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, would like to have uh, contact uh, agreements and discussions with Oswald Cruz Foundation. 
an institution, not a, a representative of government. So I think that is a, a interesting point to think, uh, because uh, uh, I think that uh, in uh, the health system in Brazil with many problems, it could um, had a role uh, very uh, important uh, during the pandemic. And this role is well considered in many situations. And uh, the idea and the, one of the, maybe the most important aspect in the last year, not in, in the beginning of 2021, but in the, the second semester of the year, was the vaccination, uh, the vaccination and the impact of vaccination in Brazil was, uh, I think, well well seen in, in for uh, many actors outside the, the country, and um, I, I I see also that uh, uh, we, as you had so many problems with su supplies with the. Um, if uh, the insume for vaccines from China and uh, so many other aspects. Uh, anyway, the, the idea of the interdependence was very uh, exposed and uh, the role of diplomacy uh, had to be uh, fostered in this sense. Um, Leticia, I can see, um, I never had to talk with so much diplomats ambassador in all the world. So I think that is a, a sign of uh, this kind of uh, process and uh, as, as well the role of institutions, not only a uh, few groups, but only the regulatory agency in Brazil is very, uh, is an agency with many international agreements with other in, agencies for regulatory proposals all over the world. So um, I think that uh, th this process in Brazil is so dramatic, of course, because of the number of deaths, at the same time show the importance of the, some, uh, the, the importance of the public health community and the scientific community. Um, and I think that uh, what we, uh, need uh, about the health policies now is to have an agenda for the new government. I think that is a very important point. What is the crucial point uh, in terms of all this agenda you had mentioned here? Uh, health, uh, digital health, uh, the preparedness process, uh, the reorganization of Brazilian health system. Uh, we have problems with the career of the uh, public health professionals. And uh, we have a, um, a lot of crucial points uh, to develop now and organize them in agenda. I think that is our uh, priority now. Uh, and as institution, we we will try to uh, contribute for this agenda. That's what I think about this. But I think that the uh, Brazilian community has many good points, as I, I had mentioned. Uh, the other question is, the other two questions, sorry, Mariana. I. Oh, it's fine, it's fine. We're here in the classroom, we're all here. The first um, is, how the COVID observatory has analyzed the return of presential classes in Brazil. How did that go? Go ahead. Yeah. I'll, I'll read you okay. the last one last. Uh, the, the observatory uh, encompasses a number of epidemiologists, immunologists, um, uh, social scientists as well. Uh, and the idea is monitor some indicators, transmission, uh, number of uh, uh, the tax of deaths, of course, the hospitalization and uh, the, the rate of transmission. And so uh, the idea of the return of uh, presential classes were uh, recommended, were really recommended 
uh, of course, in, in recent time, uh, because uh, uh, the, the virus is, of course, circulating, but the indicators are really better now. And um, uh, the effect of the not uh, pre uh, virtual classes is uh, very, very bad for students. We know this. Uh, and so there is no reason to no have presencial classes now. Uh, all the institutions, universities, and uh, the fundamental and uh, the uh, high schools and uh, so on are, are uh, uh, had to return, of course. And uh, one of the worst uh, results of this dramatic situation of pandemic was really in education. Uh, we have uh, uh, data about, uh, uh, especially in high school, uh, the students that quit the school and uh, left the school and uh, is probably we don't have the idea uh, yet of this impact in Brazil. So I think that the return classes is completely, had completely uh, agreement uh, of our scientific community. And, and some, a part of the scientific community since the last year um, defended the, the return of classes, especially uh, for children. Uh, but now we have vaccination, vaccination for children. Uh, and so I think that uh, in the best, uh, better indicators, so uh, we have no reason to maintain schools and universities closes. Uh, and uh, the idea of socialization is very important for young people, I think. Thank, thank you so much, Nizan. This is the last question. You can answer very briefly because we're also reaching um, our, the end of our time. But this is the last question from Daniel. He asks, um, at the same time, there's uh, that there are inequalities between countries on different health policies. There's also inequalities within countries. So he wants to know uh, how, uh, what, how is the impact of such inequalities in services within Brazil and what initiatives um, that, uh, does this bring for the improvement of um, health equality policies in Brazil? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, in Brazil, we, we had uh, um, we, we knew before that the impact of pandemic, uh, of course, uh, uh, we would be related to the inequalities inside the countries. Uh, so, um, we could see this uh, very well in the North region, uh, not only the problem of uh, inequalities in, in income, but also the problem of the mobility, mobility along the rivers and the crowd uh, uh, boats and uh, the difficulties of uh, execute some policies like uh, the, um, the income help. I don't know uh, the, the expression in English now. Uh, ajuda que foi feita. At the aid, but uh, it's a specific term. The aid uh, for people during pandemic. And basic income. Yeah, the basic income that was paid by, by the public. Basic income, yes, yes. Yeah. But people had to go uh, for, uh, for other, to other cities uh, in both distant in the Amazon region, it was terrible. So the wave of the variant gamer, what, that had a catastrophic effect in Amazon region. But well, we could see this uh, very well in terms of the number of deaths and uh, uh, the absence of uh, oxygen and all the, the terrible situation. Uh, so uh, this uh, shows the idea of the, we had to decentralize some uh, health units, health equipments 
um, to rest uh, reorganize the Brazilian health system. But not only the health system, also think about the mobility, urban mobility, uh, inter-region mobility. Uh, so we have uh, uh, many problems related to this. Um, we have we had published uh, an article by the people, with the professionals from our institute in Manaus, Amazon, and they show the role of the transport and the spread of gamma variant. So even the dissemination of virus is a social process. Now we have to understand this to control and to have uh, surveillance measures. Uh, so the pandemic not created, but exacerbated some traces and some inequalities present in the country and uh, uh, in the health system. And uh, show us the need of uh, have um, uh, more equip equipment for scale of some operations because you have a, a strong network for laboratories for surveillance, but we don't have a scale for process a very huge number of tests for diagnosis, for instance. Uh, so we had to think about uh, uh, what was built for this pandemic for uh, have better response in the future and to uh, to help the reorganization of Brazilian health system of uh, reinforcing SUS. Uh, today is uh, our Brazilian health system birthday. Uh, 44 years since 1988, uh, 34 years, sorry, 34 years. And uh, so I think that uh, is uh, very important to think about the, the what uh, changes we need in this process and to organize this agenda now. Thank you so much, Nisia. Um, we are, I think I can speak for all of us, say that we are truly, truly grateful for your presence here today, that you took the time to share your thoughts with us in such a busy and crucial moment of world history in the end. And so I just really want to thank you for this. And I'd like to thank my colleagues for being here. Thank uh, everybody who has sent us questions. And finally, just a brief reminder that on May 31st, we have John Torpy speaking on the social contracts in the 21st century. Once again, Nisa, this was a lovely afternoon and I hope to see you very soon here in our classroom, yes, I hope, when you, when you come back home. Thank you very much. Uh, it was my pleasure to share this time with you. Thank you very much for the questions. And uh, I hope uh, we can discuss together uh, the challenges for the future. <laughs> what is the most important for us? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.